Hi, everyone. We're about to begin. So if you could please take your seats. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to one of the final panels of the day. Uh, I'm George Ruiz. I'm head of new media over at International Creative Management. I'm going to be moderating today's panel. So you pitched. Now what? Uh, a couple of programming notes. First of all, Nat B, thank you very much, Nappy, for having us all here today to talk about uh, pitching, that process. And thank you all for attending. Um, I understand it's been a very successful uh, uh, pitch con. Uh, we hope you're enjoying it and learning a lot. Um, I do want to make the announcement that even though um, this is PitchCon, for today's panel, uh, given, our, given our, our industry experts here, they are not actually going to be taking your pitches. So if you're uh, thinking you can come on up afterward, definitely say hi. Uh, if you have comments, we'd love to hear them. But um, they're not going to be accepting ideas. <laughs> they're not going to be accepting your pitches. And, uh, and so, so please understand that, that this is not that proper forum. We are going to be sharing information about the pitching process, but this is not about pitching. Um, we are, however, um, going to be looking at comments on Twitter. So if you're tweeting any of this, uh, let me suggest that if you have comments about whether we're great at what we're doing or we're terrible about what we're doing, that you use uh, NatBPitch as your hashtag. So it's uh, ampersand NatBPitch. If you could end your uh, uh, tweet with this hashtag, it'll help us uh, do a better panel next time when you're not here. So, so thank you. Um, so uh, with us today, we have a, a great group of uh, experts, all of whom come from the entertainment uh, field in different capacities. All of them are quite relevant to the pitching process. They're all experts. They do this every single day, either pitching or catching, as it were, um, and in some cases, you know, green lighting shows or being responsible for the creation of shows. We've got um, Haley Lazitsky. Uh, she's the head of development for Ellen. How do you pronounce it? I'm sorry. Rakuten. In Ratkin Entertainment. Right. Okay, great. We've got uh, Josh Pyatt. Josh is an agent over for non-scripted uh, television over at WME. Uh, right next to me, we have uh, Kevin Pollack, actor, comedian, uh, director, and uh, now producer of <laughs> content. <laughs> and joining us today from uh, CBS Television Distribution, we have Lee Collier. Lee Collier. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, so let, me, let, me get the, uh, let me get the process going uh, by uh, asking everyone if they could maybe uh, share a little bit about um, either their best or worst pitch story. Tell us what, what might have happened there that was really memorable, either because it's something that made it really, really great or really freaking terrible. And I'll start, I'll start with, um, with one of my uh, persons I'm closest to, my client, uh, Kevin Pollack, tell me maybe if you could tell me about an experience that you had in this crazy, wacky business of ours that went really well or really terrible. Um, well, the one that comes to mind uh, would be about six months after Academy Award winning screenwriter Christopher McQuarrie won, in fact, his award for writing The Usual Suspects. Uh, he and I created a, uh, a drama pilot. And of course, because you get one year to wave the trophy, of the Academy Award, everyone wanted whatever he was doing next, so I was riding along in the catbird seat. And uh, we pitched all four networks in two days. Ultimately, all four networks uh, put in a bid, and it was quite a frenzy, maybe the greatest uh, opportunity in that regard. But one of those pitches was, um, at the time, the head of the Fox network. And um, I guess he should go nameless? Yes. <laughs> and so while we were pitching him, um, he gets a phone call and he immediately freezes and says, I, I, I can only tell you that when I told my uh, staff to not interrupt, the only way they would with a phone call is if it were a dire emergency, so please forgive me, hits the speaker on the phone and we all hear his assistants say that someone's been killed on the set of one of their TV series, and we got to listen to the head of the network deal with that for about 14 seconds by saying, you know, have we contacted their family? Please do. Let me know what else I can do. Thank you. And then turns back to us mid-pitch and says, I'm sorry, where were you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be uh, the best and the worst <laughs> pitch experience I've ever had. 
So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I take it that that show did not get on the air. Uh, it, we did a, a, a two-hour pilot that was greenlit in the room by NBC, and um, we never got on. They added a fourth dateline that year. A, <laughs> I repeat, fourth dateline. Uh, yeah, we went with them because there was actually a 10, 10 o'clock time slot coming open in the fall. Again, that bizarre ultimate catbird seat that you rarely have in pitching where all four networks are literally uh, broadcast networks at the time putting in serious bids and I think ABC sent over a briefcase full of fake money. It really was uh, <laughs> an extraordinary opportunity that was only rivaled by that one pitch. So uh, I, I was remiss. I didn't introduce Brent Zaki from TLC. He's here with us today also um, to talk about how that network um, evaluates pitches and what you should be doing. Um, so uh, any other pitch stories from the trenches? Uh, that's clearly an example of pitching not, not going well due to external forces. Um, what's an example of a, maybe something that um, was great? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for a minute. I think, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Cake Boss, which is one of the biggest programs we have on TLC. And that show, as soon as we saw Buddy Velastro basically on home video, we knew we had a star. And we knew we had to make a television show with him. So it wasn't the most polished tape. It wasn't a polished write-up. It wasn't a polished pitch, even. It was kind of a uh, home video of Buddy. And as soon as you put him in and looked at him, everybody was captivated. You couldn't look away. And we knew that we had a uh, hit show on our hands. Or, or actually, nobody ever knows, but we hoped. So it was all about t seeing the talent and just saying, we get it, right there, yeah. right in the room. Yeah, well, for us, it's our, you know, our network is very much about people. Um, so for us, yeah, seeing him and just having him be able to come through on home video said it, said it all. Did you guys, quote, unquote, buy it in the room? Uh, it, to be honest, it was actually internal development. Our casting person had found him. Our, we have an internal casting person. So yeah, we saw it, got very excited, and just moved as quickly as we could. OK, so a lot of the, f the focus on this is, is after the pitch. You, you, so you pitch now what? So I, I'd really love to sort of get the network e executive perspective, because um, we've got three buyers on, on, on the panel today, about that process. What, what is it that happens after the writer, producers, showrunners, and agents leave the room? What, what happens next? How are decisions made? I can, um, I don't know if this works, but I can speak to that. Um, my boss, I will say, unabashedly, is one of the best in the business. And so it usually comes down from how it's structured in your department. A lot of times you get departments that sit on things, don't make decisions, and that's usually the worst case scenario, both for sellers and, and frankly, for people in the department, because you don't really know the direction that you're going in. But the process that we take is, you know, every week we have a number of pitches. We take to syndication, so there's, um, there are less um, pitches that we don't take a lot of scripted pitches. We take unscripted, we take formats, we take talent, but we're very open to a lot of different ideas. And so when something comes in the room, we'll literally, we have two development meetings every week where every single person on our development team is there, including the assistants. And we go through every pitch, and we break it down of what we liked about it, what we didn't like about it. And it's truly a uniform decision of where we decide to move forward or pass on it. And you know, with the number of pitches that come in, um, it's usually a pass. But there's always something that's unique about it. And it always comes the things that we end up really liking are pieces that we feel are very sellable. Because ultimately, any buyer is also a seller. And you have to sell it to someone else. You have to sell it our, to our buyer. So we look at it from that perspective. OK, great. Um, I think you make a very, very, really relevant point. Um, uh, most things gets passed on. Um, it takes a lot of no's to get to the right yes. Networks have only a limited amount of money to invest in developing and or producing something that hopefully will become successful. So the vast majority of, of these meetings result in, in nothing getting produced for very good reasons. Um, you've, you've only got this much resources to create something great. Well, and I also think it comes to how prepared you are for your meeting, because a lot of the things that I've sold, either I've been on the buying side as a network exec and as an agent, and now I'm on the production side. And it's all about being prepared for your meeting, because most networks these days can only afford at the moment to buy a pilot and try things out. So the more prepared you are for your meeting with either the most detailed treatment or in best case scenario is having the best sizzle tape or teaser reel, whatever you call it, 
so there aren't a lot of questions for the network to have to go, okay, well, do we have to go, we gotta do a full-blown pilot or paper development or something. You want that series order if you're gonna get an order for anything. So ultimately, the best and most prepared you can be for that pitch with the most information that you can give them, as well as that way you ultimately want a bunch of networks making that bid so that it can go straight to a series instead of four-step process or you know, then doing a sizzle, casting tape, a million steps. So it's all about being equally as prepared so that there aren't any questions. They don't have to ask, they go straight to deal and then you get a series, which is a long shot, but that should be your ultimate goal. If you take nothing else away from this whole day, that right there is everything. Can I leave? Wait, I want to add one, I want to add one, we're done. I want to add one, I want to add one caveat though is on the sizzle reel, it's, there's gotta be some steak to the sizzle, mm -hmm. you know? So some people come <laughs> in, it's all like sizzle and flash and beauty, and you're like sitting there, and you're, it's like, you know, a little dose of drugs or something, and you're really into it, and five, five minutes later, you don't even remember what you watched. <laughs> and so it, there has to be some meat to it. For us, you really have to get to know the characters, and if you don't have that, then, then you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's not worthwhile for us. We're gonna, should, to, we're gonna make you do these steps. It should totally feel like proof of concept. If mm -hmm. it's a game show, it should, I should get every act of that game show. If it's a docu-series, I should meet all the characters. Because then you also have to remember, like Lee was saying, some of the network executives you're gonna pitch to have to pitch it up internally. So things are gonna get lost in translation from your pitch meeting to the president of the network or the head of development. So ultimately, the best you can lay something out in a sizzle, the easier it's gonna be for everybody, for it to be undeniable for this to be a show they want. Is it pretty essential these days to come in with video, to come in with 100%. some kind of a sizzle reel? 100%. Yes. 100%. Five, years ago, five years ago, you could sell something on, ta on paper. Now, on a I mean, <laughs> On a napkin. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> on a log line even. It's, I mean, now, you know, a lot of my work as an agent is done before we step in the room, figuring out, you know, you get, you get a concept and you try and figure out where it makes the most sense for. Another piece of being prepared, if I'm sitting in your shoes, is knowing, is watching TV knowing what's on those networks, knowing that if you're gonna take a show to Bravo and it's a, and it's a personality based show, they have to fit in between Patty Stanger and Jeff Lewis. So if you bring a show to me, I ask you, do you think that person would fit with those two and, and could, would, that, would that hold your attention if you're sitting there? So I mean, it, it's about you know, not going in and pitching Brent something that he already has on the air. That or that has already failed. <laughs> that, that would probably be my worst. I mean, you know, you, you go and you pitch some, something that he already has on the air. That's, you know, your, your client and you aren't doing a good job of, of being prepared walking into that room. But it, it has to be, you have to shoot sizzles these days. Do you always want to relate it to something that's currently on the air as a way of quickly getting the concept across? It's Cake Boss meets Walking Dead. I don't like that. I hate that. Yeah. That, 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 I don't, that's, yeah. a, that's a failed pitch. You, you want part. something that you can't relate it to. I want that show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, whenever you hear it's a mix between The Apprentice and blank, you run. Or, I mean, it's, it's just, you don't run, but it's, you know, it's, you want something that you can't relate it to because it feels fresh and it feels different, whether, you know, it's a personality or it's a concept. You want something that, you know, because that's what they tell us. They tell us, we want something new that hasn't been seen before, and we want something big and loud. Um, but do they? <laughs> I mean, they certainly say that every year, and they have for decades. And then they put the same shit on year after year. <laughs> every now and then, something extraordinary and 100% original squeaks through. So of course, somebody wants and actually develops, produces, puts on the air something fresh and new, but boy oh boy, the trap yep. of we want something completely different. I have fallen for time and time again. <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, I wish they really meant it, because they all Me say it every year, every one of them. Please, please give us something we don't have. And then that's the first thing they kill. I'll settle for huge ratings. Yes. It doesn't need to be completely different, just something that's gonna bring huge ratings. <laughs> well, and I think the hardest part is you go and you pitch someone and you'll go, what are you looking for? And they're gonna say, well, we'll know it when we see it, or yeah. we want a big hit. We want, like Josh was saying, we want something noisy, loud. They don't know until they hear it, but the idea is you need to walk in there and have the answer to every question they are going to ask you. You need to do, be able to defend up until a point until they say, we're not going to buy it. But you need to be able to answer not just why it fits on their air, but really what are the elements of that show 
that are different? Why are these characters great characters? And that's what your sizzle and your treatments and any other materials you have need to be able to express. Otherwise, they're going to hear it and go, yeah, whatever, it's the same old. But it's also about nurturing the relationship. You just said something that made me think, like, don't sell past the sale. You know, if, you, if someone's interested and wants your show, stop talking, leave the room, yep. or move on to the next idea. So people have talked their way out of something that I've liked before. They keep going, and it just sounds worse and worse the more they go. You know? mm -hmm. And then the, on the other side is don't pitch past the pass. So if someone's passing on you because it's not right for the network, you should ask a question. You should get feedback as to why. But get your feedback and, again, move on. Don't try and tell me why I'm wrong, why I don't know my network, yeah. why you know my network better than me, or why you're going to call my boss and convince them that they should do it. You know? Those are all things that, I, that, I, that occasionally I hear, and those people don't usually come back again. Yeah. So Josh, let me, um, as an agent, um, um, we have that we have that job of uh, doing the follow-up yeah. um, what what is it that you do um, once the pitch has happened it's um, how do you follow up what do you do to best position um, your client for the sale well I mean every networks different I mean every you know they have their development meetings I think on Wednesday so I mean yeah. you know you it, it, it all depends on who the producer is um, what the concept is how, how the room went but I mean you typically wait um, a few days, you, you know, you follow up, you see how the, how the, how they thought the meeting went. Is there anything that that client can get you um, so that it helps you in that room if you're really passionate? You know, sometimes you're, it's a pass right away and you're, you know, there is nothing to follow up on. Um, but they're all different. I mean, some, if, you know, you are, ho hopefully all your pitch meetings are right against each other so that if somebody likes it, you can let everybody else know that, that you know, there's interest in it and if you, you know, want it, you need to move fast. Those are the great positions where you can leverage each other. Um, but, you know, your follow-ups are, you talk to the executive that took the pitch, you know, it, it's relationships. It, you know, it really does, I know that's an, that's an easy statement to make, but it all comes down to relationships. You have a follow-up conversation with the person you pitched to, he said, wow, you know, I, I don't, it's, it's a long shot here. And you start, you know, you plead your case, but at the end of the day, you don't get so pushy that they don't ever want to take your call again. You know, or if there's something that they feel like it's missing, you go to your client, you get that piece, you get it to them so that they're well armed. Um, you know, sometimes you need to get your boss in the mix to call their boss and, you know, you do it. I've had, I've had times where I have called, I have, the network executive and I have conspired together to figure out how to get a show that they were really passionate about mm -hmm. through their internal system. Mm -hmm. You know, so it really does come down to relationships. God, I love this show. You know, the person that's going to be tough to convince is Nancy, we'll just say. Um, you know, then you're, you're finding the best person in your building who has, a, who has the best relationship with Nancy. You're briefing them on the project. You're getting them on the phone with her. You're doing every, everything you can to surround it and push. So uh, along those lines, one of the, one of the stories that I th it was a follow-up situation, we had a meeting with a client on a new media project, and new media basically is kind of wide open territory for creating different types of content, so it, it, there's no particular format, so it's pretty open. And we were trying to pitch MTV on a project that was telling stories across different platforms, video and a lot of social media. MTV seemed to like the concept a lot, but couldn't really figure it out in their heads. They couldn't conceptualize it. And this is the thing about the relationships that Josh just mentioned. Um, after we left the meeting, I followed up with the network executive. He loved it, but he couldn't, quote unquote, wrap his head around it. So um, it's, interestingly enough, this is about a month after the first iPad came out. So I sat down with the client. We literally put how this thing would look on an iPad. Just designed it using the software that, you know, found within the iPad. And then I, I, called, I called the network executive at MTV and I said, I think we've unlocked the puzzle of how you wrap your head around it, let us come in for a second meeting. And it was a relationship. The fact that we've already had our shot, but the, the executive liked it enough and then had the great relationship that, with the agency, said yes, we're willing to, to have a second meeting and spend another hour with you uh, to do this, made it work. We, we, brought in with the, we brought in the iPad, showed them, because the iPad was just out, like their eyes were kind of spinning because this is so cool and magical that we were able to have this animated presentation, and that's when they actually bought it in the room. Yeah. And they said, okay, now we understand the, the promise of what you've done. It was that sort of follow-up based on the relationship, based on answering questions that they had that led to a successful sale on a, on a transmedia property. Um, and you're going to have to fight harder with certain clients and you're going to have to 
you're not going to have to fight as hard with others. I mean, if a client, if, if a client has 25 shows on the air, you know, they're going to, they're going to pay more attention to it. You know, whereas if you're bringing in a young producer that you're trying to build, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to work harder to get it in the right place for a network to say yes. Um, is, there, is there flavor of the month stuff? Are there people that are doing it right now in all the pitches that maybe they shouldn't be, but everyone seems to be doing it? Something to avoid? Pitching pawn shows. I was just going to say that. Okay, could be done, could be formats. What, okay, what are we hearing? I said pawn. Pi pitching pawn shows, bridesmaid shows, or the hangover. Oh, the real life hangover, that's Mops. brilliant. I think I called most it that often one two pitches. days ago, too. Well, what's that? What's that, Haley? Mops, most often pitched. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh, I mean, that's just a common agent slash network executive <laughs> phrase that literally, both on every side of this, the reality business, you'll literally call your agent and be like, so, what do you think of this? It's the hangover, but with people who work at cake places. <laughs> but literally, and should I have other people have thought of that idea, they'll literally be like, Mop heard it four times from other clients. And, and you can't, even as an agent, make that call to a buyer unless that production company is a production company that has already sold 150 projects to that network and they'll buy anything from them. Otherwise, you really can't make that call because then you're the person who called and if you're the agent who's already called about it four times, Everyone at every other agency has already called about it four times. So you have to understand that if, if there are similar shows out there already on the air, your tweak to that has probably already been pitched. You know what else? Well, another thing to take away in the unscripted space is, I don't know how it works, things get in the zeitgeist, and we will hear the same pitch in a week. Sometimes it's a New York Times article, and then everybody comes in two weeks later with that idea. Uh, but everybody comes in with the same idea. It happens all the time, and the idea itself isn't really a currency. The idea itself um, is, it can be interesting, but probably I've heard it before. What will make me want to buy it or champion it is either it comes in with a producer that has a great pedigree that I really want to work with, who I know and trust who, that can deliver it, or someone who doesn't have that has something unique. They have a piece of talent locked up. They have the, you know, the best uh, winemaker in the country for a wine show. You know, they have a contract, they have it locked up, and they, nobody else could ever have that person. That's going to make you unique. So when I look at all my shows about wine, you're the only one that has that unique thing. It well, could be like, a person, a place, or a thing, but if you have it, that'll make you stand out. Well, it's like how many times, I'm sure, on the network side or as an agent, you heard the matchmaker show. Patty Stanger is why that show works. Mm -hmm. And every network has either tried or been pitched or tried internally to develop their own matchmaking show. But if you don't have Patty, it doesn't work. Yes, there are other tweaks to it, but there have been dating shows since reality TV started with Blind Date and you know other things like that, Fifth Wheel. But ultimately, it was about having that amazing piece of talent. That is why Bravo would buy a show like that. That's what made it Bravo. So it's always about attaching the talent and also being able to tweak your pitch depending on a network, which I think is the most important thing and is something we try to do at the production company where I work, is you may have a piece of talent, you know, a great host or a great expert, and it's about finding three or four different ideas with that person that you could go to TLC with two ideas for that, or you could go to Spike with that person with two ideas also. So it's about finding the people with the most broad appeal or someone that's so niche that you, there's only one place, but you know it's going to sell. But truthfully, I think it's really all about finding the talent or the topic that you can go and sell and tweak to the most networks because ultimately you want what Josh said earlier, you want a bidding war. You want style, TLC, and Lifetime all wanting your project. And that's only going to happen if you really think through what each network already has on the air, what has failed, what has succeeded, what they already have that you shouldn't be going in with, and then you have the best shot to actually go and sell something. Are you guys, okay, um, I'm gonna ask, a, you, don't, you can answer or not answer if you don't want to. Uh, who here has representation? I would say, okay, it looks like maybe less than 10% of the room has, has got representation. So let me ask, everyone on the panel, if you don't have representation, if you don't have ICM or WME or, you know, Management 360 or the collective representing you, do you even hear the pitches? No. I, no, 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 this is from CBS. Okay, no. Uh, okay, tell me well, about that. Well, I mean, I blanketed uh, usually <laughs> because there, there are very few projects that come through that end up being you know, frankly, worth your time because they're usually not as thought out. I mean, you'll sometimes find talent that's really interesting 
and we pretty much keep an open door, but the agency process is what vets projects. So, you know, you, you don't spend your day. I mean, ultimately, everyone's sitting in a room hearing pitches. You're reliant on people bringing in good projects because your job is at stake for that. You really need to produce something. So you're hoping that everyone com who comes in is going to have a great idea, that it makes sense. It's something that you can actually produce with a reasonable budget um, that hits all of those levels. And agents are, I, I sort of think of agents as our partners because they vet that process. And it's not necessarily a, a way of keeping people out, but it's sort of a way of limiting the number of meetings that you do have so that the projects that come in are actually meaningful and, and appropriate. But that might not be the answer for everyone. It, it legitimizes like your effort 100%. You have to find representation first. Uh, as a creative entity, I couldn't uh, express that more deeply and sincerely. It's a necessary evil to some, and it's an unbelievable benefit to others. Let me, let me take an alternative path, because I happen to be in New Media. I, I know some colleagues here from, on the New Media side are here um, from some pretty significant companies. Sometimes if you don't have representation, sometimes you should just do it yourself and put it on YouTube or Blip or Vimeo or a number of other sites where you can prove yourself, find that audience, build that, that community of engaged people who are going to be evangelizing for you, and then maybe myself, Josh, somebody's going to see that or manager will see it. More and more, it's happening all the time. We got major agencies and major management companies actually bringing clients that they found and concepts that they found on online video sites. And I'll uh, say a, a, just a caveat to that as well is that you know the buyers will look for those people as well. Mm -hmm. If you've got something going on, you've you know there, there are people following you on Twitter. Everyone is sort of looking for that. So if you've got some kind of an audience or a following, everyone is looking for that. Well, and same thing on the production company side because we're constantly looking for ideas, but it's usually us going and seeing what is getting the biggest hits on YouTube. What are people, even a magazine article, I mean, there are people, one of the girls I work with found something in a Hemispheres magazine on United Airlines about this woman and she ripped it out. I called the woman and we were doing a deal with her and we're gonna go out and pitch her. So it, you never know where you're gonna make your connection. There are also people when I was on the agency side that I would hip pocket some production companies who really weren't production companies. They were two guys who had ideas. And, and yeah, and a computer and they literally cut together a sizzle tape, gave it to me and I went and brought it to a larger production company that does big huge shows like Jersey Shore and we went and partnered it and they sold the show together and although those guys aren't the lead production company on something, they now can say they found and created a reality show and partnered with a big production company. So I think it's also about being able to put yourself out there to be found, otherwise it's going to be really hard for you guys to go and make those connections unless you have relationships with other production companies and or agents and managers. Okay, with that, I, um, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. We have a mic up here, so if you do have a question, I ask that you line up against the wall, and then we can uh, get the questions from the audience. Go on, get, please. Make it good. Uh, somebody just brought up hip pocketing, and um, what's what's the best way to go from being hip pocketed to actually getting on the roster? Because it also seems like hip pocketing kind of limits you from going elsewhere. Come up with a really good idea. <laughs> I was just going to say. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, ideas make the world go round. There's, you know, I mean, you have a good idea, you're gonna, I'm going to put you in a room with my biggest client. You know, it, it, that's one of the reasons they have us, is to find ideas for them. Um, you know, to, to go back to that last question, because I feel like we all, everybody on here, I feel like has hustled in one way, shape, or form to get whether it's working in an agency, a network, you know, having a great acting career, it, it, the onus is on you guys, I think. There's more than enough information out there these days to figure out a way to get people. My, one of the assistants in my department showed a YouTube clip today of somebody that they wanted to sign in our staff meeting. You know, I mean, it takes zero time to find out who the players are in any world, whether it's scripted, non-scripted. If you watch television shows, you see a logo at the end. Every one of those logos has a production company website. Every one of those websites has bios and things like that that you can get to people. You may have to sign something saying that you won't sue them, but you can get to them. 
And if you go out and you do the legwork and you just bring something to the table, don't just bring an idea. Like go find a piece of talent that's that's fantastic, that's Buddy Velastro, and sink your teeth into them so that you're up, you have to be a part of the process. Um, you know, and then to take it one step further, don't be so concerned about your deal. And I mean, not to sound like an agent shark, you know, but you know, know what the bigger goal is. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Don't you know, worry about splitting 50-50 on your first deal. Get in the game. Once you're in the game, then you get hip pocketed. Once that show becomes successful, then you're not hip pocketed anymore. Then, you know, then everybody's like, oh, it's that guy. Well, and the great part about being hip pocketed is ultimately there's an agent there who believes in you. So you get that great show, he partners it with a great production company, then all of a sudden three more happen, four more happen, and all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, why isn't that guy a permanent client? Like get that guy on the roster because all the other production companies want to work with him. Or the ultimate goal when you sign with an agency is for you to be the next Mark Burnett. That's why they sign you. So they need to be confident when they're selling to the other agents in their department that they believe you can be. So that's all on your court. They're not going to make you the next Mark Burnett. You got to make you the next Mark Burnett. Hi, my name is Royston Kraba. I am the executive producer of Rap, Rinse, Repeat, uh, the web reality show. We have on YouTube, you know, over a quarter million unique views and all these people that follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, my question that I'm asking you is that I have identified eight revenue streams for this brand and this property. How important is that to, if, if I was going to pitch you tomorrow, how important is that? Or would you rather just have me show you the sizzle reel and go, you know? When, when, I, when I help repair clients to do new media pitches um, to networks, uh, technology companies and studios, Absolutely. If there's a business plan that we can present alongside the show concept and show there's revenue here, we just have to make it and to get to get to it. Absolutely. Bring it with you. Talk about the brands, the integration, the sponsorship, how you're going to work it in into the show. We have Procter & Gamble interested. But what, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone has got <laughs> Unilever or Procter & Gamble or Ford or one of these companies interested. The question is, what does that mean? Interested, does that mean that you have somebody from Team Detroit at Ford saying, hey, if you, if you find distribution, I'm in for a million dollars? Or does it mean that someone took a call and said, yes, this looks interesting, we'll get back to you? I'm, I'm, not, you don't, I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm just saying that everyone has got that so-and-so is interested, William Morris is interested, or WME is interested, or you know, Mark Burnett Production is interested. A re, you, you can really only say that if you really have a tangible way in to that brand and there's something that's genuine there. There's a certain amount of fluffery that comes with pitching, mm -hmm. try, imagining the future and just making it happen, but at the same time, you gotta bring something real to the table. If Procter Gamble is genuinely interested and you make it part of the pitch and you can actually deliver on that, you're far ahead in terms of getting this, this, getting this financed by one of, the, one of the buyers up here. Okay, yeah. Right, am I right or? or yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Ariane, uh, happy to meet you all. Uh, I have an original TV pilot, and uh, I just have, I mean, you are mentioning a sizzle reel, and uh, I just did elaborate work on the script and story bible and uh, writing original songs, and I mean, for a sizzle reel, I, I've just been sort of advised to hold back on doing that, because then it would, it puts, ideas in people's minds that might be not what the show, the way that I see the show. Like if I say, okay, well, actually, I could shoot this for $500,000, but I can't shoot it in my backyard for $20. So I'm just wondering about like I think a lot reel. of what we're talking about with sizzle reels is non-scripted yeah. shows, yeah. Um, because oh. those are things, if you're gonna go shoot, it's like Brent and I worked together at E! and someone pitched us the Kardashians Six years ago, year, whatever. No, a year, a year, a year before, before the Kardashians became a show was pitched to us. And then and finally, it's like doing a sizzle reel, you know. For somebody, for us to finally buy it at the time. And so it's really the reality stuff that has to have a sizzle reel. Okay. I can't really speak to the scripted world, but it, there's nothing really to show. It really is the script. Um, in okay, order okay. to get that sold, it's really more for non scripted shows. For writers' meetings. Okay. Yeah. If I were doing a non scripted, which I'm not, but I might at some point. Would that be, a scissor reel would be like a 10 minute presentation of like... 
I'd say highlights probably, of it it depends if it's I mean there are certain things competition elimination shows unless it's just a teaser tape you can't really you're not going to go out and cast a, a reality show in that way a competition show you're not going to go cast top chef in theory this is the show I want to sell but if you have a docu series if you have a show like cake boss you're going to go film 4 days in the cake shop and edit together a tape so that I could see all the By characters, the everyone's going to be there. It should be just long enough to sell the show. Yeah, yeah no more than five minutes. Yeah, I mean, just Literally. long enough to get the idea across. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take an online question because we do have an online audience who is watching oh, wow. the live stream. Apparently it's in the millions. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> they, they just want to watch Haley. As far as I know, that. it's in the millions. Um, so the question we got uh, was, does my opinion of a production budget actually matter? Yes. Is it, is it, does it at all relate to my project um, when I'm pitching? I will say that that is a very, very important piece. Um, we recently heard a pitch that sounded really interesting, and we're talking to producers who've produced a number of things, and we said, well, that seems really interesting, though not that feasible, because how do you really shoot it? And they clearly had not thought through the budget process because we said, you know, what do you think an episodic cost is? What do you think on a weekly? And granted, these were very senior producers, people who we like, but not knowing how much it's going to cost, that's essential. It's, it's a, still a very risky business, you know? And so the more information you have, the better. Great. Hi, I'm Brenda. Um, I've been doing stand-up comedy for the past few years with no agent, and I have created a television show. And uh, like you say, uh, networks are not going to look at it if I don't have an agent. But agents all have this policy of no unsolicited submissions. So my question to you is, <laughs> who do I have to fluff to get an agent in this town? <laughs> Josh, <laughs> I'll sure let you answer that one. People oh. asking that question. Josh. Josh. Oh. Josh. <laughs> That's awesome. You have a taker? Josh, you've you know, got a date. Yeah. No wonder I don't have an agent. Uh, I mean, I think it goes back to, you know, what I said earlier. I mean, I know it's, there, there's people in our building that go to comedy shows every single night. You know, it's right place, right time, right act, right, you, you know, I, I, there is no, there is no kind of formula to it. I mean, if... Chelsea Handler has a production company. I mean, figure out who, who works there and who the right person is to get it to. I mean, it's, you know, that's why I say it's... Um, I guess the CEO of E is single now that they broke up. So maybe that's the right route. And he's no he longer the CEO of yeah. E. <laughs> you know, I think close to that is it's referrals. Um, a, lot of, a lot of how we find our clients is referrals by people that we trust. Uh, other, the majority of the clients that I represent um, have come as referrals from other clients. People who said, hey, have you seen the show online? It's great. Right. I, what if you don't know people who have an agent? I mean, you, you, no you have to You have you to know get out there and people. Meet people. <laughs> you right. have to know different people. Just not have better. to go to bars and ask up people and say, do you have an agent? Lawyers, managers, um, uh, casting people, um, uh, you know, other people, actors, you know, but, writers, directors. But if you're at comedy clubs right. all the time performing, like they make friends with other performers. They're swarming around there. Yeah. 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 We're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Hi yes. there, my name is Cherie, independent producer, Full Dummy Entertainment, and it's really kind of a tag off of what she just said, but it's more about the non-scripted. So to oh, Josh, can you step up to the mic? Sorry, Thank you. to Josh, I'm not talking about here. Okay, to Josh, um, do you guys ever have scenarios where you open it up to, I mean, people that don't have representation, to where they actually come in with, you know, <laughs> What, what I does mean, that look like? I don't understand exactly the process there. Without getting crushed after this thing is over? I mean, I actually take some of these. You know, I mean, when I get stuff, you know, I'll either have some. Well, first of all, we, you have to go through a process at our company so I don't or we don't get sued. Um, you know, but some of the junior, some of the younger agents will have a look at that stuff. You never know where the next kind of idea is. Yeah. Part of what we do is taking a thousand crap meetings so that we can find one nugget that we can show to somebody that turns into American Idol. That's part of my job. It's, you know, it, somebody said it earlier, we're a clearinghouse, we vet things. Um, you know, and you know, the bigger clients you get, the less time you have to do those. But I mean, you know, we have, if I get an idea and I can't look at it right away, I'll send it to one of our younger guys who will look at it and, and he'll say, you know, I either love it or I hate it and there's your first kind of hurdle. And then from there, if he likes it, 
we take a look at it and if I like it, then it goes to one of my companies and you know, so it, it, it works itself out. But you know, it's getting to one of those people. Often when, you, when you're evaluating ideas and they're not represented, um, you know, we, we're looking at it from a team perspective. It isn't going to be one agent, it's going to be the agency behind the idea. And while you have a principal point of contact, you're quote unquote your agent, that person's going to need help from other people within the agency. So often they take the temperature. They, they, they might think something borderline or great. They want to get consensus from other people who will hopefully join them in, in developing this person, this idea, and getting it out there. Because we often work in teams. Um, and that's what you want. You want somebody who's really passionate, your point person, but you want the whole agency behind you. I mean, here's another example of just how, like when we go back and we say hustling, every show has an executive in charge of production at the end of it, okay? Yeah. You know, your name could, I mean, it, it credits on television. Call that person's office, take the assistant out to lunch. By the way, but do not say you're my personal friend. This yeah, happened that, earlier in the week. Someone called and said their personal friend wouldn't leave a message with my assistant, and I was racking my brain trying to kill myself. You know, like, oh. do, I, do I know this person? I found out, I was like, you know, I'll take a flyer. I tried calling them back, and they tried to pitch me, and I, I literally just went off on them and, and, and hung up. Because it was a, it was a, it was a lie. Yeah, don't you lie. Don't Be lie. upfront. I want to learn the business, and I mean, yeah. you know, every year Deadline Hollywood announces what assistants get promoted. Re read it and reach out to them. What are they, the worst they can do is say no. You know, I mean. So just make the phone call. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I didn't. I worked in finance before I started working at an agency. I cold called assistants inside agencies to take them to lunch to, to learn more about what they do. And you, you, you reach enough of them, you get a good idea, and you also then have people who will help you internally. Well, same thing at a production company, too, because ultimately, yes, the ideal way is to go and get an agent, but at the same time, if you have a friend or your mom's sister's cousin works is a PA at some production company, that PA can easily walk into the head of development and go, listen, my friend gave this to me, do with it what you will, but I think there's something here. I'm gonna watch that tape. I may go, you know what, watched it, not good, tell your friend thanks anyway. But at the same time, that, that got someone in the door. So okay. you can't always, it can't always be, yes, getting an agent is ideal for going to the network, <laughs> mm -hmm. but when it comes to production companies, like Josh was saying, like all the credits are out there. You wanna know who, rep, who you know, produces Jersey Shore or this one or that. It's all available information for you and I'm sure you'll walk into a supermarket tomorrow and run into a PA who works on a show. Like it just, you, I guarantee you know someone who knows someone. And at the risk of an avalanche of ideas, I'll say that uh, Discovery Communications, <laughs> we actually have a, a submission process for people who aren't represented where they go, you can go online and you can fill out a release form and then submit your idea. Granted, it's gonna be vetted you know, at a lower level. They're gonna go through it, they're gonna make decisions. But every once in a while, something will come through that will make it into our bigger meeting that we'll really kind of discuss. And it might even spark an idea to say, hey, you know what, this was a really interesting idea. Why don't you reach out to the person um, and start a relationship? I, We've had I, some I, tremendous ideas come from these fine uh, people who have experienced the other side of where you're coming from. So as a creative person, I can tell you, take all of this information to heart. You, 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 there's no price you can apply to it. Uh, it, it's unbelievably valuable and it's also all the things you need to know in the sense of the hustle, preparation, the only way you will get ahead is to do all the research ahead of time, all the preparation that they've suggested. It's the only chance to get your foot in the door without proper representation while you're searching for proper representation. The hustle is yours. You're limited by your imagination. Take all the information you got, please. This is, you guys are amazing. Sometimes the worst thing you can do is be represented by a big company. I mean, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I, I, I know that sounds strange coming out of my mouth. Sometimes the worst thing you, you want somebody that's passionate mm -hmm. about you. Right. Period. The end. Right. And if they work at, you know, Johnny Bumbleseed Agency, then you know what? Go work with them. Because, you know, yeah. they'll wake up every morning thinking about a way to, to build your business. Mm -hmm. Now that's true. Some of the smaller places, where they work hard for their clients that are, that at a big agency would you you know you check in on them once in a while mm -hmm. yeah I mean, the best yeah. agents lose sleep over their clients they really do they care about them and they, that's why they don't take everyone on passions we, everything except for the Johnny Bumbleseed they're dicks <laughs> 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 we have time for one more question before we can wrap before we have to wrap up yes. hi Linda Vito Lindy Films and I have a question about I see here on a lot of um, the catchers are looking for hosts 
producers, talent? Mm -hmm. What is it that you look for when someone's looking to pitch that? We're not talking scripts or anything like for that. For a host? But host, talent. What are we looking for in talent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, most Do you of want them to have a reel with them? Oh, or yeah. I want, to see what they, I want to see what somebody looks like on tape, because mm -hmm. I really want to make sure that I don't want to turn them off right away. Um, and and there's, a, there's a certain quality that people have, I think, that jumps out at you. There is a certain quality, and I, you, you cannot say, it's not even about being polished, although that's important. It's not a, it, it definitely about being prepared. It's definitely about going out there and having done the work. But certain people, and we meet them in every walk of life, have a quality that you just cannot stop looking at them. They may not be the most beautiful. They may not be the smartest. They may not be the most eloquent. But whatever it is, you don't, you want to sit with them. And TV, in particular, is a very intimate relationship. You know, you sit in your bed, you sit on your couch, you know, you're walking in and out, and you want to spend time with these people. So uh, to me, it's really important to have that quality. So instead of having a reel, if someone had their card with a QR tag on it that you could just go to and scan? I'm not you know? going to. You're not going to? No. I'm being completely honest. Yes. Uh, if you're going to go and you're coming in and you're talent, I should have either already been sent your reel beforehand and I've already watched it and I'm prepared or you're coming in with the DVD or whatever, you're showing it to me on an iPad. People are so busy that the idea is unless you're an expert in something that I am specifically looking for and I need you, if I'm just having a general like, yeah, come in, we're always looking for hosts, like you need to be the go-getter. You need to be the one that goes, this is why I'm different. And you need to walk in the room and within three seconds, I'm like, oh my God, I could sit and talk to you. I mean, a host that Brent used for something the Not other it. day, came in, used for TV, um, came in the other day and, wow. sorry, came in the other day <laughs> and I literally sat and talked for an hour and a half because this person was so great and someone I would be friends with, which meant people are gonna tune well, in and that person will break through the thick glass of TV and people will wanna sit and tune into them every single day. Let me just say this person in particular was my assistant. So not my current <laughs> assistant, but, but a previous assistant that we used actually as a correspondent for the royal wedding coverage that we had. So he was a correspondent for us on a worldwide live broadcast. He is extraordinary. He has a career as a host that he's gone on to do already. Um, his relationship was important, but he, he's one of these guys who has a quality that no matter where he was, when he was answering phones and helping people into the office, people liked him. People wanted to spend time with him. And that was, I mean, I, like I said, he had that quality and he does his homework. But the funniest part was I didn't even get, he didn't even get to me through Brent. A friend of my boss's called me and said, there's this host, he's really great, we're friends, will you just sit down with him? And I did it. Because you never know who that person is, where they're gonna be, and then Brent actually called me and said, I heard your meeting with him, I was like, and then he emailed Brent after to say, I just met with Haley, she's great. And now I will do whatever I can to get that guy a job on a show that I may have or a friend may have, because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. I mean, we'll all say it, it's, it's about networking. It's about every person you meet could be a potential boss or friend or something that helps you in the business. And so you just gotta take advantage of every opportunity and every person you meet because you never know who's gonna be the person who buys your show or hires you as a host. Thank you. Okay, so, so. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna okay. add just one quick comment on that is that, you know, in that respect, the better you can <clears throat> do for someone, I think there's sort of an aspect of like figuring out, oh, how do I get this? How do I get that? But if you look at everyone else's jobs and think, how can I make their life better? What do they need? And look at it from that perspective, because in the end, you know, we all want to succeed. So looking at it from how I can help this person will only help you in the end. <clears throat> And on that inspirational and practical note, I want to thank our guest today. Thank you, Kevin Pollack. Thank you, Lee Collier. Thank you, Josh Pyatt. Thank you, Haley Lozitsky. And thank you, Brent Dackey, for your time today. Thank you. We, we all hope you learned something. Uh, enjoy NatB. Thank you all very much. Thank you.